So this morning, we're beginning a new series called Jesus Praise. Over the next, I think, 11 weeks, 10 or 11 weeks, up until the, the first Sunday of Advent, we will be looking at the prayers of Jesus. And he prayed quite a lot. We're going to talk today about when he prayed and where he prayed and why he prayed. And then over the next 10 weeks, we'll be looking more specifically at individual prayers of his, in his words, that are recorded in the gospel. J. Mike Minix, founder of More Than Bled Ministry, Bread Ministries, wrote this about prayer. There are needs which only prayer can meet. There are problems that only prayer can prevent. There are hurts that only prayer can cease. There are battles that only prayer can win. There are atmospheres that only prayer can create. And there are souls that only prayer can reach. This morning, we're going to begin with the sermon entitled, what's that say over there? <laughs> You're, we're time with the Father. The Apostle Paul wrote in Thessalonians, pray continually. And in other versions of translations of the Bible, it says, pray without ceasing. Paul learned this from Jesus himself. As he said in Galatians 1, 12 to 13, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And that's a whole story we can go into sometime about how Paul spent some years in private ponderance and prayer um, with Jesus before he started his ministry. And we'll talk about that some other time. It seems odd, doesn't it, that Jesus, who is God would pray to God. It's kind of puzzling. But we see in the Gospels that he did pray to God. He prayed all the time. I mean, there are recorded prayers all throughout the Bible, dozens of times that the Gospel writers wrote and Jesus prayed. And then there are a number of times that the Gospel writers recorded the words. So this morning we're going to look at the when and the why of the recorded instances of Jesus' praying. Under what circumstances did he drop to his knees in prayer? In what situations did he go alone to commune with the Father? What did he seek in those times of prayer? Then over the next 10 weeks, we'll look at, as I said, the individual prayers. And what we're going to learn is that Jesus prayed continually, what Paul talked about. He was constantly in communion with the Father. What did he say in those prayers? What were the purposes of his prayers? And they weren't always the same purpose. Each week we'll see from a particular prayer what we can learn that might help us in our own prayer lives so that we can become better prayers. I don't have any doubt that all of us could be better prayers. And I don't have any doubt that by praying more and praying better, that we could change our lives and the lives of others in remarkable ways because God hears prayer and he answers prayer. And you know that, Dan. You know that. So let's begin with a few examples of Jesus', Jesus praying. Luke 5.16 tells us Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. It was Jesus' practice to often pray in solitude without an audience and sometimes to pray for long periods of time. Mark 1.35 says in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. 
<clears throat> Matthew 14, 23. It says, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And Luke 6, 12 says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. <clears throat> Why was Jesus going off to pray? And what was he praying about in these long periods of time that he spent away, alone by himself? Well, if we look at each of these passages in context, we look at what comes before and what comes after, we get answers to that question. At the end of Luke 4 and the beginning of Luke 5, Luke is describing Jesus' early ministry, and he's walking around Galilee from village to village and town to town, and he's healing people, and he's teaching all the time, constantly on his mind to be doing those things. Luke tells us of him driving a demon out of a man in a synagogue. He tells us of healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law of a high fever and healing a man with leprosy. Verse 514 tells us that Jesus told the leper not to tell anyone about his healing. But in verse 15, it says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and, and to be healed of their sicknesses. Now, how did Jesus respond to this pressure, this growing pressure as more and more people began to follow him and demand things of him? Verse 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He sought quiet time with the Father to rest, restore, receive the Father's comfort and guidance, and to renew his strength in order to continue this stressful ministry that he had on earth. Now, how many of you have felt, as Jesus did, pressured from all sides in your life, your work, your home, whatever's going on, problems with the kids? We all have. Even children feel those pressures. I remember when my son was in elementary school, every February, every February he would, he would become cranky and difficult. And then February vacation would come. And his whole mood would change. And he'd go back to school feeling refreshed. And the rest of the year he did fine. And he made us miserable for those few weeks before that February vacation, but then after the February vacation, things, things straightened out and got better. Well, Ann and I felt like that a couple of weeks ago before we went on vacation. We'd had all kinds of pressures in our lives. Ann has a new job. She'd been learning all kinds of new things over the last couple of months. It's hard to go from one job to another. We'd been, a lot of things were going on in church. We'd been finishing off a couple of rooms in our house. Ann was doing all this major landscaping in the backyard, helping her brother paint to get his house ready to sell. Just all these pressures building up. And so we needed a break. And so we went on vacation. And we got that wonderful time of relaxation. But if you seek that rest and relaxation with God as your compa companion, you get more than just physical, mental, emotional rest and restoration. You get spiritual restoration. And we all need that too. And that's what Jesus felt. Jesus felt the stress and fatigue. And he needed the physical and mental and emotional restoration. But he also was giving of his spirit all the time, which we should be doing as we give Jesus' his love to other people. And so he needed also that spiritual restoration. Now, Jesus didn't have the luxury of two weeks at the Cape or going to Disney World, which Ann and I were going to do, except that COVID blocked that from happening. But we will. We'll be doing it eventually. Jesus didn't have a Disney World to go to. And he didn't have time because he had only three short years 
to give this message and to spread it out, to train people to carry it on. And so he didn't have time for a two-week vacation. I don't think you'll find anywhere in the Gospels that says Jesus took a two-week vacation. Pretty sure of that. He had time for an occasional few hours, like with Mary and Martha having dinner. And with Mary, oiled his feet. But he didn't have time for a two-week vacation. But what he did have time for was to be in communion with God. Sometimes for hours at a time when he had just simply had to get away. The father, the son, keeping their relationship strong and fresh by spending quality time together and keeping Jesus strong and fresh for the road ahead, for the work that was to come, and for the pain that he also knew was coming. Well, God desires to have quality time with us, too. But the only way that that can happen is if we take time to pray. And Paul, of course, says, pray always. Be always in prayer. Well, that doesn't mean get down on your knees and just stay there for the rest of your life. But it means keep open communication with God. Prayer is communication. Talking. Expressing. Emoting. And listening. Listening has to be part of our prayer. Because God has things to say to us. Important things to say to us. And we won't hear him. If we don't put some time in our prayer, some quiet time, where we can listen, it's not a one-way street from us to God. It should be a two-way street in a relationship between us and him. What other reasons did Jesus pray besides respite from the pressures of his ministry? Luke 6, 12 says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now we learn in the next two verses after that that this was not just simply to rest and rest restore himself. It was also to seek guidance from God about an important matter. As he had traveled around Galilee in these days, more and more people had come to follow him. Some of them he called, like Andrew and Peter and John and James and Matthew. But others had simply come along with him. And the time had come in his ministry that he needed to pick his inner twelve, the ones that he would be giving special attention to, special training to, so that they could carry on once his work was done on earth. So verses 13 to 15 say, When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called a zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So he called those 12 to him to be the closest ones, to travel closely, to learn the most, to prepare them for further work in the future. This was such an important decision for Jesus that he was not going to make it without conversing and communing with the Father. The future of the whole Christian church for, the, for all time was in the hands of these 12 men initially as they took his message out to the world and spread it out. And so he wanted to pick the right 12. He wanted to make sure in doing that that he was following the wishes of the Father. So he spent an entire night in prayer before he made the announcement the next morning of who those 12 would be. I wonder if Bill Belichick spends a lot of nights in, in prayer before he makes the decisions on who's going to be on the starting 
team the next, uh, the next Sunday. I'm sure he does. <laughs> I'm sure he must. Near the end of his ministry, Jesus expressed the importance of these times of conference, conferring with the Father. In a prayer in John 17 that, that goes on for the whole chapter that we'll be looking at over several weeks later on, he said to the Father, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me. And they accepted him. So Jesus acknowledges here that not only did God pick the disciples... And of course, we know God knows all that's happening. And so he had picked the disciples way back before there was an earth, no doubt. Not only had God picked those, but then he taught Jesus through these prayer times, told Jesus what to teach the disciples. And in verse 15, it says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Hang on for just one moment here. You protect him from the evil one. There's another reason why we pray and why Jesus prayed. Intercession. We did that this morning for Jonna and Johnny Mack and his new bride, Nikki, and for others. Now, should we pray for ourselves? Well, of course we should pray for ourselves. Jesus is pretty clear about that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus got down on his knees and three times he said to God, Father, take this cup from me. That was a prayer that was just for himself. He was afraid of going up on that cross. He did not want to go through the pain of human death. And he prayed, God, Father, please take it from me. Don't make me do this. But your will, but not mine, be done. It's okay to pray for ourselves. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Who's going to ask and knock except for ourselves? So of course we should. God cares about helping us with our troubles. But Jesus shows through his prayers that we, all should be, we also should we be praying for others. It's so important. Most of John 17 a whole chapter of prayer by Jesus. A wonderful, amazing chapter of prayer that's definitely worth reading and studying. is devoted to intercessory prayer, to praying for others, for asking God for favor for other people. And he prays in there not only for the original disciples, but he prays for us. The ones who would follow, the ones who would come later, when Jesus healed the blind man, he looked to the Father. Now, it doesn't record that he prayed, but it's obvious that he prayed. And then he said, Ephatha, which means be opened, and the man suddenly saw. When he knew Peter was going to turn away and deny him after Jesus' arrest in the garden, Jesus told Peter that he had prayed for him and for the other disciples to have strength against the temptations of the devil in the days and weeks ahead. And when he was dying on the cross at his lowest, lowest time in his 33 or so years of life, what did Jesus think about and pray about? Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. 
what they do. These were all prayers of intercession. And according to Paul, death and resurrection have not stopped Jesus from making intercessory prayers for us. In Romans 8, 34, Paul wrote, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised, for, raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Right this moment. Right this moment, Jesus is at the right hand of God pleading for our spirit. Imagine that. Pleading for us. Why else did Jesus pray? He prayed in gratitude to the Father. Luke 10, 21 says, In that same hour he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. He said grace. I think that's cool. Jesus said grace over his meals. He thanked the Lord for provision. He did it at the Last Supper, you remember? We do that, we go through communion every, once a month. And when, after Jesus thanked for the blessing... Matthew 14, 19 says, Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took up the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. He prayed blessings over the food. And he prayed blessings over children while laying his hands upon them. It says, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. He prayed at his own baptism. He prayed when he was happy. He prayed when he was despondent. He prayed in all circumstances. He prayed continually. So what do we learn from Jesus' prayers? We learn what Paul learned directly from Jesus through Revelation and what he told the church at Thessalonica. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, because that's what Jesus taught us to do. Being always in prayer means being always open to communion with God, actually through whatever communion we have with God, any communion, even if we just have short little prayers, we grow in our relationship with him. But if we stay in communion with him all the time, we grow so much more in our relationship with him. And the holier, holier our spirit becomes through sanctification, because the Holy Spirit that is in us wants us to be in communion with God and helps us to be in communion with God and teaches us through that whole process of prayer and cleanses and purifies. And isn't this what Jesus wants for us? In John 17, that chapter-long prayer that I've mentioned twice now, the night before his death, Jesus made his desire for us clear. He wrote, or he said to God, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So, let us pray to God, not occasionally, not when we think of it, not only at bedtime and during grace, over meals, but continually. Be in communion with him. Know he's with you. Think about him as you go through the day. 
in the best of times. Let's share our exuberance with him. Thank you, God, this is a great time for me. And you're at the center of it. In the worst of times, seek him for comfort and for healing. When we are uncertain, seek his direction. When we are uneasy and need a steadying hand, seek his stability in our lives. Let's pray when we're grateful. Let's pray when we're angry. Let's pray when we're despondent, disillusioned, when we're enthusiastic, all the time. Let us pray for others who we know are hurting or have needs that only God can fill. Let us pray in all circumstances at all times because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Let's learn from Jesus. That's why he came for, three year, for 33 years, but taught for three years, for us to learn from him. And let's start right now with a prayer. Right now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that we have Jesus Christ as our example. And we are so grateful, Lord, that we have Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in us right now. And Lord, we are so grateful that you are there and ready to hear us and even speak to us in our relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, for what you give us. Because you give us everything. Without you, we'd be nothing. And so we pray for help in our prayers. We pray for help in our communion with you. We pray that you would help us keep our mind focused on you. Day in, day out, moment by moment. To live our lives for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.